What do you think is special about Eric Weinstein for what you know of his work and his mind? Mm -hmm. The way he sort of straddles so many different disciplines. It's like a Renaissance man. There are very few people like that at any given moment, let alone the 21st century, where information has become so you know, huge that it's almost physically impossible to be able to keep track of things. And yet he, uh, he does, and he has his own unique vision and unique point of view, and he has integrity, which is like almost impossible. Like I can't think of <laughs> so many people who possess that, those qualities, almost no one. And also the ability in some sense to um, to embody the balance that you talked about of both the rigor of ma mathematics mm -hmm. and the, uh, the imagination. Humanity also, I would say. You know, like we talk about him imagination um, as a kind of a counterpoint to uh, knowledge or logic, but just basic humanity, you know, just ba basic, just compassion, just being able to, because um, every destructive, I would say, like every destructive, um, society, you know, like be it Germany, you know, under Hitler or uh, Soviet Union under Stalin and so on, was based on some kind of uh, what was considered unassailable truths. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a conceptual system, you know, if you think about it, right? There is a beautiful episode of this um, series by um, Jacob Bronowski, you know, um, where he talks about, he filmed it in uh, Auschwitz, talking about the certainty that what led the Nazis uh, to p killing people wholesale was a certain, it was almost a mathematical idea. And they just basically bought into this idea and checked out their humanity at the door. So I would say that antidote to this type of thing is not necessarily even imagination in a kind of elevated sense that we have been discussing today uh, that is exemplified by our, by our greatest um, scientists and philosophers. But just basic humanity, you know, basic human, basic common sense of just like knowing that this is just not right, and I don't care what my what my ideology tells me, but I'm just not going to do it. So that I think is kind of missing a little bit in today's society because people get a lot too caught up in in the ideology in in certain conceptual frameworks. So societies that lose that basic human compassion, that basic humanity, run into trouble. Oh, very much so. But and, not only society, like a human being. And uh, Eric is one of the people, I agree with you, keeps that flame of humanity. Like, I, I trust that he will not do something that's not human, that's not right. I just feel that, you know, like there's some some people, you just kind of feel that they won't cross that line. Yeah, And that's a huge thing, you know, to, today. Because I have to say, looking back, definitely, I have not hurt people personally, but like I could be mean, for instance, I could be harsh. And now I see it as a sign of weakness, as a sign of insecurity. You know, I saw I saw your interview with uh, Ray Kurzweil mm -hmm. the other day. Beautiful, I was really moved by it. But you know, that at some point I was like, I, I, I looked at him at this sort of like Dr. Evil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of ashamed of it now, but like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of coming clean. And I would, you know, because, well, why? Because I needed an adverse adversary in my mind mm -hmm. because I projected onto him kind of the fears that I had, that we will be, that AI will conquer us and so on. And this was rooted in my kind of, awakening moment in a sense, a kind of a moment where I suddenly started to see the other side. So, but I wasn't sure yet, you see? You had to feel it. So I had, had to, to have a fight about it. <laughs> yeah, you had, I had to had, actually I, have the projection. I had to, so it was not in, I, I believe that it was not in me already. So I had to throw it onto somebody. <laughs> yeah. And that's not balance yet. So balance is when you recognize that it's you actually. So, and I had this moment actually, it, it was so amazing. Like I would give this mean, I would talk about AI and the dangers, and he would always be my like um, foil. You know, like I would put, I would put like a sinister photograph of, yeah. of him on the slide. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, look at this guy. Yeah. He wants to put nanobots in, into your brain. And he's also like a high end, high a top executive at Google and so on. Like, so I would create this whole narrative. And then something happened uh, where I was giving a lecture, this is 2015, 
at the in in Aspen, Aspen Ideas Festival, which is a wonderful festival. It's a keynote speech actually, and I and I was doing my my usual stick, and then suddenly I said, I came up to that, uh, and there was a big screen, and there was a picture of him there, and I came up to the screen and I kind of touched it with my hand, and I said, but. I don't want to pick on Mr. Kuswa because he's me. <laughs> I had this revelation that I'm actually fighting with myself, with my own fears. And and then I learned about his um, his um, his father. That his father died when he was young, and that he's in fact he's very um, to his credit he's very um, sincere and upfront about it self disclosure i think is very essential by the way in all this discussion like what really motivates you he said it he said it publicly many times even as, as early as 2015 i could find this information that he wanted to re reunite with his father in the cloud and suddenly i saw him not as a caricature that exemplified all my fears, but as a human being, who, a child longing for his father, grieving for his father. So suddenly it became a story, a love story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that is, so in other words, I've seen it in myself, this capacity to project my own fears and then fight with other people over something that actually was my own. And as soon as I got to this point of seeing him, and then my next lecture, actually I talked about it, about him in this way. And I and I said, look, you know, it's a, it's a love story. And he is actually, um, and it's not how I would want to reunite with my father. Uh, but like you said, you know, the, the, uh, if I am consistent, I have to allow the possibility that different people um, perceive things differently. And so for him, that's his imagination. So you know how, who is this Vol Voltaire, I think, is ascribed to Voltaire. So it's like, I disagree with you, but I will fight to death <laughs> for you to have the right to say it. Yeah. So now that I, I feel like my position is more like, I disagree with him, that this is the way to, to approach death and to approach the death of loved, our loved ones and how we miss them and how we, you know, that sense of loneliness and inability to interact directly. That That's not something that it is nice with me, but I think it's also, it can also be called imagination from his perspective. And look, motivated by that, how much he has brought, how many interesting inventions like his musical invention, for instance, naturally because his father was a composer, a music composer and a, and a conductor. So in other words, from a, in the bigger scheme of things, even if I think he's misguided, still, I can't deny that it's a certain leap of faith for, from his perspective to try to say that this is the way we can all connect to our loved ones. And because it is sincere, and I see it now as sincere. And in fact, in your interview, you really teased it out to him. And I was, I was really moved by it, I have to say. It's like, he has mellowed a little bit too, I said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was really, really sweet when he talked about his father. And I can relate, you know, my father died four years ago. And I can relate what a heartbreak. Uh, I was much older than Ray was when his father died. But I can relate to this, um, to this longing and that grief, you know. And... When he is somebody is sincere and he puts his uh, opens his cards and you know and says this is why this is what I want to do it because I want to recreate my father and I want to be able to talk to him this way. Then we have a serious. Then we understand. You know, the opposite of it would be not disclosing mm -hmm. and just um, pretending that this is how. It's supposed to be in you know, scientific terms. So it was replacing your real emotion but come from the heart by some kind of a theory which comes from the mind. And this is where we can go astray because then we get become captives of, of frameworks and conceptual systems which may not be beneficial 
to yeah. our society. In tough times, we need the people that have not lost their way in the ideologies. We need the people who are still in touch with their heart. And you you mentioned this with, with Eric, it's certainly true. I disagree with him on a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. but I feel like when the world is burning down, Eric is one of the people that's you can still count on to have a heart. I've talked a lot over the past year about uh, the war in Ukraine and the possibility of nuclear war. And it feels like he's one of the people I would call first um, if um, if God forbid something like a nuclear war would begin, because you you look for people with a heart, no matter their ideas. That's right. Uh, it takes courage and it takes a certain self awareness, I would say, and which brings me. To, you know, I think the crucial is that that which was inscribed, you know, on the temple of Apollo in Delphi. There was a statement: "Know know thyself, know yourself." You know, like who am I? Ultimately, it boils down to this. And uh, all these debates. And the point is that I was like, I used to be, like I said, you know, pessimistic at some point, and I was scared even of where development of AI was going. This is about 2014, 2015. And now I'm much more. So, for instance, after I saw Ray Kurzweil mm -hmm. as a human being, after I could relate to him and sympathize with him, suddenly I, I stopped seeing him in the news. Like before that, I would always see him in the news saying, we're going to put nanobots in your brain da, 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 by the year 2030, whatever, you know? And then we upload you to the 20, by 21st. And I would be like, no, you know, the story was terrible. Suddenly I didn't see him anymore. I had to, you know? Yeah. So now it makes me question, who was creating the trouble? <laughs> what was all within Was you? it him who was creating the, stirring yeah. the trouble or was it my mind, you see? And so as I become, as I became self-aware, Suddenly, other possibilities opened, and suddenly that conflict, which, by the way, if I kept giving this nasty, you know, talks about him, one one day I suppose we'd have a debate, yeah. and so you have this um, one person <laughs> says this, and then, then yeah. and what I learned is that it never, it's a never-ending conflict. This conflict just does not end. But there is an alternative. There is a better way, which is to realize that it is you arguing with yourself. Now, if you want to continue arguing with yourself, continue as long as you need. Just be careful not to destroy too many things, you know, in the process. But there is an option of actually dropping it, of actually dropping it. This is so, I was so surprised by this. Yeah, it's discovering in yourself the capacity, the human capacity for compassion. And you understand that he has a perspective, he is operating in the space of imagination, a human being like you. And we're all in this kind of together trying but, but to figure this out. Both, yeah. ultimately. And also it's like, with realizing how much I have screwed up, you know, <laughs> comes this humility also. Yeah. So like, I, f I find it extremely hard now to like really lash out at somebody and to say like, you're horrible, whatever. Because immediately the question is, who am I to criticize, you know? So is there another way to have a dialogue? Is there a way to, you know, speaking, you know, since we talked about, um, the innocence of a child and how much it drives a discovery in science and so on. You know, I remember, I, th it was, I think I heard of Adya Shanti who gave this nice example. He's like, when you're a kid, you know, you go and you, you play with your friends and then you fight with another kid. And he was like, I hate you. I don't want to see you again. And you just go home like after half an hour. Okay, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You want to play? So you come out, it's like, hey, you want to play? You don't talk about what happened. You don't rehash this, you know, just keep going. Yeah. And sometimes I think we are on the verge, maybe, of learning that. Because I think that if we are can if we continue to push each of us our set of ideas and like ideologies and like you know what matters to us and so on. Like, yeah, but no, no, what matters to you, but like there are other ways to approach other people. There are other ways you can find point of contact. Speaking of which, mathematics, mathematical formulas are universal, represent universal knowledge. Two plus two is four, whether you vote for this guy or that guy in the election. You know, how about that as a, com as a point of, of contact, of commonality, you know? And nobody can patent those formulas, did you know that? There is a Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. that mathematical formulas cannot be patented. Like Einstein could not patent equal E equals MC squared. It doesn't belong to him because if the formula is correct, then it belongs to everyone. 